Good evening. Good evening. Good to see you all out and about tonight. Uh, take your Bibles. We're, we're, we are going to uh, highlight Deuteronomy one more time this evening. I'm not going to read through all of that, but you can start there in chapter 6. And uh, I am going to dig right in. We're going to finish this lesson this evening. So I'm not going to review. If you happen to have a little study sheet from the last few weeks, we're going to be toward the end, uh, number three. So follow along if you will. But we're... It is probably second, third page. I'll let you know. I'll, I'll give you the third page. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to start there. Deuteronomy 6, verse, verse 4. We know familiar scriptures uh, dealing with we're, we're context. We're dealing with the blessings of Christian education. Okay, so the, the necessity to educate our children in the Lord. Uh, this is our, our platform text, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And here's really the, the key verse. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And we're going to jump right in here. The role of the church in Christian education. God's desire uh, for young people is that they would cultivate a heart for him. And then also develop a mind of Christ. That's what we want to see in our young people, right? Whether that's through a Christian school, whether that's through our church, but as a church, that's what we're desiring to do. We want to cultivate these young people uh, to, to live for the Lord, to desire to live for the Lord. We talked about how Christian education that nurtures hearts for God can help lay a solid Christ-centered academic foundation in a child's life. When we close, we'll sort of see how all this melds together. So what is then the church's role in Christian education? What, what do we do? And the first thing we're going to look at here tonight is, A, I think in your sheet there down the, down the way, is to teach the principles of God's Word. That's what we're desiring to do as a church. Teach the principles of God's word. God has given us, the church, you and I, the responsibility of teaching his word to, to everybody, to all that will listen, not just moms and dads, but to children, to young people as well. Now turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we'll see some verses here, some scriptures in the New Testament that'll walk us through these principles. So 1 Timothy 4, verse 9, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So there are many ways, right, where we can teach the principles of God's word, even given here in this scripture. Obviously, we can teach through the word of God. That's that give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, but we can also teach these principles by the way we live. And I don't want us to overlook that aspect, right? We can get so focused and listen, the word of God is the most important. We, we, we need to be teaching these things, but we also need to be doing our best 
to model these principles for our young people, for the children that come in and out of our church. And you may say, well, I don't have a role. I don't, you know, I don't teach a Sunday school class. or I don't have a role in junior church. You don't need to have an active role in those programs. All right, you can pray. You can be a part. You can, you can be, uh, uh, you know, an, an active encourager to those that do. But your role then is to to have the young people see Christ's likeness in how you respond to things, how you deal with others in church. We even talked about, you know, in, in, in parents raising their children, you know, fathers not provoking their young person to wrath. And we said one of the ways, right, a parent can do that is by sort of living that double standard, right? By having all these godly principles, but yet yet living in a way that's contrary to the word of God. So let's let's be sure when we're talking about teaching these principles, you know, we're honing in on every area of our life where where we can truly show Christ's likeness, where we can show them in, in a real world uh, situations and environment how, listen, living for God is the best decision they will ever make. Applying these principles of God's word will be the best decisions they will ever make. And then living that out before then. More than a child needs academic education, they need to understand the principles of God's word that really then help them navigate through all the issues of life. It's just like us, isn't it? Right? The older we get, the more mature we get, you know, the more we understand and learn scriptures, we then can go through trials or circumstances in our life where we then apply these truths, right, in a practical way in our life. That's what we want to see our young people eventually come to be able to do on their own. And through a, a good Christian education, through the time we get with them and we can implement these principles, a young person can, can learn both. They can learn biblical truth and then they can learn to apply it through every area of their life. So the goal of Christian education from any forum is to help young people develop the mind of Christ. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. They give a note in our material here, it says a little known fact today is that the United States, and you know this, public school system actually began with scripture center education. Right, so how many of you, a raise of hand, uh, still were taught from the scripture, the Bible, when you were in school? Anybody here? I got, yeah, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, come on, Mrs. Light. I, I'm just teasing you. We prayed in school, too. I was teasing your age there, and it just went right over you. So, uh, <laughs> so there's a good six or seven of you, right? So how many of you still prayed? We'll, we'll say that, as you said. How many of you still had prayer in school? One. Well, there's a class, maybe. You know, you prayed for... No? Yeah. See, we did. I still did in elementary, you know, in elementary. That was at public school. All right. Very good. So they said, back to our, our I'm getting off track here. Scripture Center Education. The first elementary school supported by tax money was established in Boston in 1647, just five years after Bay Colony was established. This Puritan community passed an ordinance that required at least one qualified teacher for every 50 households holders and a grammar school in every town of more than 100 families. It also put the Bible in the center of its curriculum, asserting that one chief project of the older deluder Satan is to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures. So their purpose was we want a Bible-centered education because we know Satan is out to get our young people. We know he wants to attack their mind, their heart, and, and they, they were saying, listen, we want them to be structured, to be founded, sounded on the scriptures. Now we know today's schools, supported by our tax dollars, have tried to ban anything related to Christianity, right? We hear these stories all the time. Uh, 
Chuck and I just prayed about this in our prayer, right? It seems that there is no room for Christianity in our public schools today, right? Where once they displayed the Ten Commandments, those are taken down. Where once we just talked about, they allowed prayer in classrooms or graduations or at sporting events. Now we see coaches uh, that are trying to lead their teams in prayer and practice are persecuted against. Uh, we see, you know, uh, scenes of nativity, Christmas, all of these things attacked in that public school environment, right? They're just desiring to, to eradicate anything that's centered on God's word and especially centered around Christ. Now, we said in the early days of the, the early classroom instruction uh, where it was founded on scripture, now we've gone so far, right, where where there is no presence of God in a public school. In fact, that's, that's what they really are driving to do. We talked about that humanistic uh, mind frame last week, but now today those, those humanistic educators, they would have young people, parents, school boards, just believe that academic learning and spiritual truths are are in, in, incompatible, right? Where they, they shouldn't be melded together. But we know how important those things are together, right? As Christians, we believe that God's truth should permeate every area of, of our relationship with the Lord, every area of our life. And Christian education reinforces really the relevancy of truth for all of these areas. It interweaves God's word, back, talking now back to the school, with the subjects of learning. Right? I mean, I was fortunate to be able to finish out, you know, 7th through 12th grade in a Christian school. So, you know, each of my teachers, it didn't really matter what class we were in, uh, you know, we, we learned, you know, academics, but we also then balanced that with Scripture, right? So how the body, you know, is uniquely created by God, you know, in biology and, and you know, a, Brother Jeff here is a chemist and the elements and all those things. We learned how, look at how wonderful God's creation is, right? All of those precepts were woven around uh, God working in our life. At every opportunity, God's principles are brought back to the heart. So we see that responsibility is to teach the principles of God's word. Secondly, it's to teach Christ-centered academics. As Christians, we want our children to make Christ the very center of our lives, right? To, to learn to align every other area to him, right? With God's word. Yet, as we said in the public school, children are taught that the very name of Christ is an offensive thing. Right? It's too offensive to be said. So by implication, what are they being taught? They're being taught that they can acquire all the tools and knowledge they need for life without God. Right? That's at the root of this, right? We can teach you anything you need to know, and you don't have to have any, any uh, relevancy of God surrounding it. They are raised by this philosophy and this environment that teaches that life goes on with or without God, right? And, and then that, that stems to that God's not relevant, God's not important, so then what, what is? Right? It, it then just goes down to the matter where it's dependent then on how you and I feel, right? how the student feels. So God's absent. We don't need him in our teaching. We don't need him in our life. So therefore, I mean, just common sense kind of weaving this together is then just live for yourself. Live for whatever makes you happy. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, we'll read these verses. Uh, verse 3 through 5 describes... The seriousness of educating people to live apart from God. It says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, 
and the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Now listen to this and apply this to what we see in our country and our society today. Verse 4, he is proud, knowing nothing, but dotting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil uh, surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such what? Withdraw thyself. In other words, get away from this. So we look at, we've said this many times now over the course, what stemmed this is what I saw on these campuses. And boy, we see this played out, don't we? An absence of God, a teaching to rely on self and how you feel leads to absolute foolishness where these young people will stand with terrorist groups, will stand against Israel, will stand for the destruction of the Jews. This is exactly what Scripture's teaching. So this, this ripple effect, right, well, it's no big deal that we took prayer out of schools. It's no big deal that we don't use the word of God anymore. You know, these young people will eventually make that own spiritual decision for themselves. Listen, we see what that sort of thinking gets us, right? We see where it draws our young people. So having an education without the knowledge of God and a relationship with him is to live an empty life, right? It's to live a lost life. Who wants that for their young person? Some see academic knowledge and spiritual instruction as distinct and unrelated from another. In our material, it says, in reality, the best framework through which to gain academic knowledge is a spiritual perspective. Through this filter, knowledge that is contrary to biblical truth will be discarded. I thought, boy, that's a pretty good principle, right? We're, we're desiring, we'll see here in just a minute, to raise our young person uh, not only to, to live rightly and justly and do those things that are pleasing to God, but we're trying to train their minds around the word of God where then they will also then spot foolishness for themselves or they can spot then unbiblical teaching for themselves. Uh, one, one man was quoted, cursed be all learning. This is going to be important in a minute. Cursed be all learning that is not subservient to the cross of Christ. Now that was quoted by John Witherspoon. Anyone know who John Witherspoon was? He was the first president. Yes, you know? Well, you got it? Who was he? You had it. Ricky had it. Yep. Princeton University. The president of Princeton University. Now, look at where we've gone today, right? In higher academia. Cursed be all learning that is not subservient to the cross of Christ. To what we hear today from all this higher education. Secular institutions can impart a degree of understanding, right? We're not refuting that in math and science and English and history, but they cannot, without God, direct a child's heart toward true wisdom. True wisdom comes from a relationship with the Lord. Psalms 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of Wisdom, a good understanding, have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. So this mindset of we don't need God in our schools and in our colleges, let our young people get to an age where they find God for themselves, is a destructive mentality at its core. Only Christian education, the school, the church, and our home will point our children to awareness of God's presence and their accountability to him as they assimilate and use knowledge. And that, in essence, is the error. We eliminate God, 
we then eliminate all accountability, right? We, we, don't, we don't ask the question of how do I deal with my sin, right? How do I stand before a holy God someday if we live the way we're living for the flesh? See, to cultivate hearts for God. That's the third reason uh, that we are what we are trying to achieve in Christian education as a church as well. Nothing, we talked about this a few weeks back, is more tender than the heart of a young person. They're easily influenced. They're especially palatable, right? They're pl- or rather pliable. We see it over and over again. Secular education can provide a measure of knowledge, but Christian education can cultivate the soil of the heart, encouraging that young person, encouraging those spiritual appetites, and setting a lifelong direction. Right? We simply can't stop short by educating minds. We must reach their hearts for God. And that's what we want to do as a church. Right? We don't have these programs and classes just to fill a time slot or to get people involved in church. We want these young people to be transformed. We want them to be saved. We want them to understand what it's like to have your sins forgiven. We want them to have a relationship with, with the Lord. We want to develop them at the earliest stage we can get them. And education is not worth a great deal if it teaches young people how to make a living, but not how to live. And boy, I don't know about you, we, we've had this conversation many times, and we would all it'd be in agreement tonight, where would we be without the Lord? Amen. Where would we be in our life, in our decisions, in our family? Where would our children and our grandchildren be today? We understand this principle, right? It's not just enough to teach our young people. We must teach them how to have a relationship with the Lord. A successful Christian life reflects far more than outer conformity. In other words, it's not a successful Christian life just isn't about you know regular church attendance, although that's important, or adherence to standards, although those things are very important, or the appearance of spiritual interests, right? Those are all wonderful things to teach our children. We want to teach our children those things. However, it is the expression of a heart consumed with Christ and passionate about glorifying God. It's true for my own child, right? Uh, sure, do, do we want to see him involved in church? And, and, and there are certain standards of which we expect of him, and we want to have see spiritual interest in his life, but there's coming a point where I want to see him make these decisions for himself, right? When he matures, and it's not just because mom and dad or grandma and grandma or anybody in his life do these things where he comes to make these decisions on his own. Ephesians 6, 6, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. This is why basic Academic education just is not enough. Theodore Roosevelt Jr. said to educate a man in mind and not in morals is to educate a menace to society. You know, and that's pretty true, pretty powerful for today. All of us are born sinners. Providing education to a sinful nature, I thought this was, it's, it's a little laughable, but it says providing education to a sinful nature just makes children smarter sinners, right? It's not changing their heart. It's just they're, they're, getting, math, they're getting better in math and science and history, but they're not learning what what were a true foundation they can stand on. Second Timothy three, but continue, verse fourteen. Thou in the things which thou hast learned and been insured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know, one of the best 
remembered education slogans, I remember this, and it was even before my time, was a tagline of an advertisement from 1972. You may be able to finish this. A mind is a terrible thing. To waste. Right. I mean, I knew that. How did we know that? We're too young for that, aren't we? Right? But a mind is a terrible thing to waste. That was actually a slogan uh, used by the UNCF to help African Americans obtain higher education. And it's true. It says here in our material, a mind is an incredible gift from God and worthy of being educated that it might be more uh, disciplined and useful. As tragic as it is to see a mind wasted by neglect of education, it is more tragic to see a mind corrupted by ungodly education. Right? So this is the principle we're trying to adapt. This is why God instructs us to fill our minds with truth and to guard our hearts. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Education is valuable, but an education that develops hearts for God and the mind of Christ is invaluable. It's worth the sacrifice. It's worth the investment. And I've said before, listen, there, there may be, you know, homeschool uh, may work for you. You may be qualified to do that if you're uh, still in those years with children. Uh, but there's even still a cost to that, right? Christian education is an investment. It is not free. Um, however, uh, when we're when we're looking at the cost of of this sort of education, right? Compared to you know what your tax dollars will get you nowadays in a public school, I think we see where the value lies, right? Wouldn't we much rather, if we can, place our young person in 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 the midst of educators? That, that love them, that care about them, that, that want to educate them and all of these academics, but then also want them to see how all of these academics is, is then balanced with the word of God. And I've said before, we are blessed in this church to have educators in public school that try to do that very thing, right? They are the light in these public schools and they do their best to weave in just to implant in the mind of these young people, hey, th there is a God, there is a creator, you know, those kinds of things when they have that opportunity. Uh, but, but we know uh, that's that's no longer uh, the heavy hand. That's no longer statistically the way it is. So I'll, I'll end with this this little quote here from our lesson. It says, Christian education doesn't cost. It pays. It is an investment in eternity. I look at my own son, and, and I, I, you know, he's going to be 13 here very soon. And I even scratch my head sometimes and wonder how he would do in public education. It's hard. It is a difficult thing today. And he's a pastor's kid. He knows biblical principles. But boy, there is no way, there is no way. I would put him in that environment, right? It's, it's not going to happen, right? So, so we, can, we can try to do the math, but listen, the investment is, is worth its weight in gold because they're getting a, a biblical education, right? It's grounded upon God's word. And then he'll have to make the decision, just like we all did, what we do with that, right? Right, whether then we adopt it for ourselves, and that's what we want to see in the life of our young people. So this isn't just Christian school. This is what we want to do as a church. Right, as we teach our young people, whether you have an opportunity to be involved in, in those types of programs 
or whether you're a person that can just come alongside and say, listen, I'm praying for you. Say, hey, listen, uh, I want to be an example in your life. And you show them the love of Christ. You show them what being a mature believer is all about. And I would say most importantly, we show them how living according to God's principles just in our life is the best decision they could ever make. They need to see adults that are happy to be believers, right? They need to see adults that are happy to know that they have a relationship with Christ and that it's not just about rules and standards and what not to do. It's about a joy in the Lord that only comes from a relationship with him. Let's pray together tonight. Father, we love you today. We are a thankful people. Lord, we have your word. We, we are a people tonight that have received it. Lord, we have a relationship with you because of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray as we look at these simple principles, Lord, of the importance of Christian education, whether that's in our home, our, our school environment, or in our church, God, I pray at whatever stage of life we're in, whether we're still parents, desiring to be parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, God, I pray that we would be a people that would invest in the lives of our young people. Lord, that we would show them the joy of the Lord. We would show them how, how being a Christian, how being one of your children is just the greatest gifts we could have in our life. Lord, so I pray tonight we would do our part to be that testimony, to be the to light unto these young people in our own church here. Lord, again, as we've been praying for them, and we will continue to do our young person, our teens outside, even right now, downstairs, Lord, our children's ministries, that these young people will, will one day, Lord, adopt these scriptures, these principles for themselves. We, we want to see them saved. Lord, we want to see them have newness of life. And then, God, we want to see them decide to live for you. And help us, all of us, Lord, to be a part of that. Lord, in a meaningful, impactful way in their life. Lord, protect them. Lord, keep them from evil. Lord, help them to make right decisions early on in their life. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to use us, Lord, in a great way as we as a church, Lord, want to reach the family, the home, uh, our children. We want to reach everyone, Lord, uh, that we can, that we come in contact with. We pray these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight.